So hello and welcome to the first of 80 modules for the study of AP psychology. I know it probably seems like crazy amount 80 modules, but I swear AP psychology is such a fun course. Um, and we have a long journey covering 14 units, but I promise you, well, I pretty much promise you <laughs> that you will likely learn and likely enjoy it. Um, psychology, after all, is really about us. Um, what contributes to making us who we are? How do we learn together? Why do we make the choices we do? Why do my friends act the way they do in groups versus individually? All different kinds of things that we're gonna be exploring as we journey through this course. And just to introduce myself, I'm Dr. Jessica, and I'm gonna be narrating through all of these slides that go sort of hand in hand with the textbook from um, David Myers and Nathan DeWall. It's called Myers Psychology for the AP Course, Third Edition. So here we go. In module one, we're gonna be talking about psychology and its history. Now in unit one, which is unit one of 14, the whole overall unit is called Psychology's History and Approaches. So within unit one, it's about history, today's approaches and subfields in psychology. This is probably one of the shortest units within the whole entire textbook. So what are some of the learning targets that we're gonna have for unit one? I wanna talk about these at each, the beginning of each module and then sort of loop back around and connect to them at the end of the module to make sure you understand these learning targets because these are very important if you decide to take the AP exam um, at any point. So first of all, you should be able at the end of this module to understand why psychology is a science and why the rat is always right. Next, you should be able to describe the key elements of the scientific attitude and how these, adi and how these elements support scientific inquiry. How critical thinking feeds a scientific attitude. Um, you should be able to describe how psychology developed from its early understandings all the way back to like the Greeks um, to now, to modern science. And how critical thinking feeds a scientific attitude and smarter thinking for everyday life. So I think we're gonna be connecting this idea of scientific thought to how you approach everyday life. And then explain some of the um, things like behaviorism, Freudian psychology, and humanistic psychology, and how they helped further develop the field of psychological science. So how is psychology a science? Well, um, is it a science? Yes, it is a science. Why? Because it utilizes the tools of science to understand behavior and mental processes. These tools, what are they? Well, they're things like description, explanation, prediction, and especially control. These are things that are part of science and definitely very embedded within the field of psychology. So just to start off with, the whole idea of why is the rat always right within the field of psychology? Facts speak for themselves. Researchers, no matter what they hypothesize or what they believe, have to accept the results of the study, even if their own hypothesis has been proven wrong. This can be really tough, right? When you really think you understand um, a concept or something and you make a hypothesis and it ends up being really wrong. Well, that doesn't matter because you're utilizing science. It doesn't matter what you thought ahead of time. You have to use the results that you get. What is one key element of the scientific attitude? One very, very, very important element is curiosity, asking questions, okay? So what, are, so what would be some good questions? Um, are stress levels related to healthy, health and well-being? That would be a good question. A harder question <laughs> um, could be, can some people read minds? Uh, you, you could definitely uh, develop some sort of study about that, but um, don't get too excited about res what results you might find. Okay. What is another key element of the scientific attitude? Skepticism. I love this. Skepticism, being a skeptic, sifting reality from fantasy and demanding evidence. In psychology, as in all sciences, we demand evidence. We're just not taking what people believe or what they, um, their own interpretations or perceptions of something. Psychology demands evidence. Okay, so some of these things, uh, these questions here to the left, like do our facial expressions and body postures affect how we actually feel? We could design a study to figure that out. Do parental behaviors determine children's sexual orientation or not? Again, we could design a study to figure that out. You may have some preconceived ideas, 
But in psychology, as in all scientists, science, science fields, we demand evidence. What is the third key element of the scientific attitude? <laughs> this is a tough one for some of us. Humility. We have to be willing to accept incorrect predictions. As scientists, sometimes we're wrong and that's okay. We learn from it, right? That is, we have to be humble in our attitude towards what we're studying. The term critical thinking is often thrown around in lots of different fields, especially in education. But what is it? What does critical thinking mean? Well, here are five things. <laughs> Examining assumptions, um, appraising the source, discerning hidden biases. We all have biases and we have to try to make ourselves be more aware of them. Evaluating evidence and really assessing our conclusions. So what are the things um, that philosophers wonder about the mind, okay? Things like, how does our mind work? How does our body relate to our mind? How much of what we know is innate? How much comes from our experiences? There's a lot from the field of philosophy that has been translated into the field of psychology. In some ways, you can almost think about the field of psychology as a melding of philosophy and biology. I heard, I've heard someone say before. And um, I think that's a really interesting basic way to understand. So going back in history a little bit, some of the first people interested in um, philosophy slash psychology were the Greeks. Um, great thinkers at an early time. Three of them that you've probably heard of um, throughout your education are so Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. Well, Socrates and Plato thought that the mind and body were separate. The mind continues after de death and that knowledge is innate. That means born within, like within you. That's more of like the nature point of view if we're thinking nature versus nurture. Aristotle, on the other hand, uh, thought that knowledge comes from observation. He felt that knowledge was not innate and he felt a strong need for data. So the French, with um, one prominent philosopher, René Descartes, agreed with Socrates and Plato um, about the concept that knowledge is innate. And he did lots of dissection of animals. He did lots of different things, showing that fluid in the blood flows through nerves to muscles causing movement. Um, and he made a lot of advancements in our understanding of how people are thinking and just had some uh, really fascinating takes on life and how we think about the world at an early point in our history. So the British with Francis Bacon, who is a very important name in the, in the field of science because he came up with the idea of empiricism. He sort of thought of as the founder of modern science. And John Locke is another person whose ideas kind of are a little bit more similar to Aristotle and that idea that we're born a blank slate, that that's what tabula rasa means. The mind at birth is a blank slate on which experience writes. And um, later on in the course, we're gonna talk a lot about behaviorism, which grew, grew a lot out of this idea of tabula rasa and the mind being a blank slate. So with Francis Bacon and that really important highlighted term of empiricism, it's important for you to really understand what empiricism is. It is the idea that knowledge is the result of experience and that this and scientific knowledge is developed through observation and experimentation. Okay, so empiricism is a fundamental concept of science. So now we're gonna move on to some of the famous early psychologists with the first one being Wilhelm Wundt, although some people call him Wilhelm Wundt. Um, he was German and he actually established the first psychology lab. He won it in Leipzig, Germany, actually, in the late 1800s. He wanted to measure the atoms of the mind um, and understand the fastest mental processes. So what did he do? Well, once Wundt's experimental design question, what did he test? What was he curious about? Um, so in two separate trials, subjects were asked things like to press a telegraph key as soon as they heard of the sound of a ball hitting a platform, as soon as they were consciously aware of perceiving the sound. So those were the types of things Wilhelm Wundt was studying. And he was one of the first people to really be looking at any types of these questions in a scientific way. So what did he find? What were the results? In the first trial, the subjects pressed the button in one tenth of a second when they heard the sound of a ball hitting a platform, but it took two tenths of a second to wait until they were consciously aware of perceiving the sound. He had a student who actually maybe even became more famous than him, um, 
Edward Titchener, who basically brought his ideas uh, across the Atlantic to the United States. I believe he was at Cornell. And he introduced the concept of structuralism to study elements of the mind. And he wanted to use this idea called introspection. So structuralism was an early school focused on identifying the elements of thought and mind, the structures of the mind, the way early chemists developed the periodic table to classify elements. That was Titchener's hope that he could develop some sort of periodic table type thing to classify elements of the mind. Of course, you kind of know he didn't really have success with that. What was the idea of introspection? What was the process of looking inwardly to directly observe one's own psychological processes? There was, a, and I think it's important to say here that this area, while very intriguing and help, an area that really helped to develop psychology as a scientific field, it sort of stopped after a while because they didn't really have, Wundt and Titchener didn't have that much success in really developing this idea of a periodic table of the mind, so to speak. So let's enter this next guy you probably have heard of, Charles Darwin. <laughs> um, Darwin, of course, came up with the theory of natural selection and the natural selection of mental and physical traits and the idea of adaptive evolution. Well, he highly influenced a very, very famous psychologist named William James, who is up next. William James introduced the concept of functionalism, and he wrote an extremely important text in the field of psychology called The Principles of Psychology. It's actually still used in certain um, universities uh, to study psychology. It's been so, it was so well received. And I think it took him a really long time to read, to write it, um, even though he had not anticipated it would take him so long. So what is the concept of functionalism? Well, functionalism assumes a purpose. Smelling and thinking must have helped us evolve. So that structure of the consciousness must serve a function. So why is it that we smell? Why is it that we do the things the way we do? Why is it that we have these thoughts or we behave in this way. To William James and the functionalist, it was because it must serve some sort of evolutionary, evolutionary function. Smelling is what the nose does, thinking is what the brain does, but why? So that was the kind of things that they were studying. So another important person within the field of early psychology is Mary Witten Calkins. And I think I want to just stop at this point to tell you, we're going to be mentioning a bunch of these psychologists briefly here. And then as we go throughout the course, their names may come up again and again. So what were additional important milestones in psychology's early development? Well, Mary Witten Calkins is a famous early psychologist who was, happened to be female. And she was a student of William James. Brilliant. But she was denied her PhD because she, because she was a woman. And back at that point, back at that point, that was just not okay. She was not allowed to be in like these psychological circles they had, and she was not allowed to get her PhD from Harvard. Now she met all of the requirements and like, I believe outscored all the males um, within, within her studies, but she was not allowed to actually get a PhD from Harvard. They offered her one from Radcliffe and she said, no thanks. She was a memory researcher. And then she went on to become the first female president of the American Psychological Association. So um, Mar Margaret Floyd Washburn was actually a student of Edward Titchener, and she was the first female to earn a PhD in psychology, and she did a lot of studies with animals and wrote a book called The Animal Mind. Two more psychologists that we're going to hear a lot about that had a very strong influence early on in the field of psychology are two of the most famous, probably two definitely of the most famous behavioral psychologists that you may have actually heard of, B.F. Skinner and John Watson. Now, B.F. Skinner is known a lot for his work with pigeons and animals and things like the Skinner box and those sorts of things. And John Watson, on the other hand, did research at Johns Hopkins University. And one of the most famous studies he is known for is the Little Albert study, which we will be learning a lot about in our chapter, our unit on behaviorism. So what is behaviorism? Behaviorists really felt that psychology should be an objective science. Observable behavior is important to study, not the unseen mental processes. Okay, so to behaviorists, it was all about being objective. The only thing you can study to them are the things you can see, not what's going on in the mind. Now let's contrast that with this next guy who's probably someone you've definitely heard of within the field of psychology, Sigmund Freud. Um, 
Freud, of course, was Austrian and working in a very different place than in the United States, which was what I was talking about. Many of the previous psychologists, they were mostly in the United States, except for um, Wilhelm Wundt. So how did Freud further the development of psychological science early on? Well, he developed an influential treatment process called psychoanalysis, and he came up with um, a pretty detailed personality theory. So what is Freudian or psychoanalytic psychology? Well, in contrast to behaviorism, Freudian or psychoanalytic psychology believes that unconscious forces, things we can't measure, things that are internal to us in, in childhood experiences are what are really affecting our behavior and our mental processes. Another approach within the field of psychology that um, really came to prominence in around the 1960s, 70s was humanistic psychology. And it's still, there's still some air pockets of popularity among humanists as well. Um, Abraham Maslow and Carl Rogers are two people that we will definitely be talking about later on when we touch upon humanistic psychology again. And the basic underlying principles of hu humanism, humanistic psychology are that humans strive to reach their full potential, that we should have unconditional love for others, when we're, especially when we're in a therapeutic setting, and that we should be really focused on personal growth. So as opposed to behaviorism and psych the Freudian psychoanalysis, humanism is thought of as sort of the third force in psychology. So we think about modern psychology, we had early on in the early 1900s, John Watson and then B.F. Skinner, behaviorism. Parallel to that across the Atlantic, Freud was coming up with his psychoanalytic theories, which became very popular. As those sort of waned a tiny bit, humanism really took off and became a third force in the field of psychology. It rejected both behaviorism and psychoanalytic psychology, and it was more about the study of potential and personal growth. So we're now at the end of our first module, and let's review a little bit. So how is psychology a science, and why is the rat always right? Well, psychologists are scientists. They use the scientific method. They think critically, critically and they accept the results, even if it goes against what they had hypothesized at the beginning. So what are those three key elements of the scientific attitude and how do they support scientific inquiry? Well, the scientific attitude encourages us, us to be curious, skeptical, and humble in testing ideas that don't agree with ours. How does critical thinking feed a scientific attitude and smarter thinking for everyday life? Well, it puts ideas to the test. We must examine assumptions, appraise the sources, discern hidden biases, evaluate evidence, and assess our conclusions. So thinking about the history of psychology as a field, how did it develop from early understandings of the mind and the body to the beginnings of modern science? The Greeks thought a lot about whether or not um, our thoughts and ideas were innate, nature-based, or if they came from experience, were more nurture-based. John Locke, you know, was, a, was someone who believed in the idea of the blank salate or tabula rasa, and Sir Francis Bacon is sort of the founder of the science, scientific method that we think of, and he gave us the concept of empiricism. So what are some important milestones in psychology's early development? Wilhelm Wundt, establishing the first scientific psychology lab in Leipzig, Germany. Wundt and Titchener together um, coming up with structuralism and introspection, and then William James coming up with functionalism and being heavily influenced by Charles Darwin. So how did behaviorism, Freudian psychology, and humanistic psychology further the development of psychological science? Well, John Watson, probably the founder of behaviorism, most would consider him to be, focused on studying be observable be behavior, whereas Freud really focused on unconscious influences in psychoanalysis. And Rogers and Maslow, the third force of psychology, are known for humanism and focused on human potential and human striving for growth. So thank you for listening to our first module within our AP psychology self, our AP, I'm sorry, within our AP psychology um, 80 modules that will be coming up. Thank you.